So I'm going to be talking about headache. There we are. So um, what we're going to be going through is an introduction. We're going to talk about why headaches are important, an assessment, um, how to perform that assessment and the specific, specific red flags for you to look out for, and some common causes of headaches and things that you need absolutely need to know. So to begin with me, um, so I'm Dr. Akash Doshi, Akash. Um, I'm an SD3 in endocrinology, diabetes, and general internal medicine. Um, and I love to teach, that's why I'm doing this. Um, right at the top, you can see my website, um, and that's got a load of learning resources as well. But onto the talk, why is it important? Well, headaches are important for lots of reasons. So the first thing is it's so, so common. I mean, look at us, we've all had a headache in our lives. Um, and actually, if you look at the average population, the adult population, about half of them will have a headache in any given year. So it's no surprise that it makes up about one in 10 GP consultations. I mean, wherever you are, primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, and also on the front line, community, you're going to see headache endlessly. And that's why it's so important for you know, need to know how, how to assess it and how to manage it. Most headaches are absolutely safe, um, over 90%, 90 to 95% are absolutely safe, but there are lots of headaches um, which, are, which are quite dangerous. So primary headaches are those where the headache is the main problem. Secondary headaches are where the headache is a symptom of an underlying quite dangerous disorder, and that's what we're worried about. And the real thing that, if, if there's one thing that I want you to take away from today, it's getting a bit more comfortable with how to differentiate between the two because it can be really difficult and it can be really scary for, for the person in the community or the person in any setting to know when do I intervene and when do I do all of these extra tests and when do I sit back and just say no 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 I'm going to reassure you because actually stressing about what's causing your headache will cause more of a headache than you currently have and so that's where the headache assessment comes into place. And so the first thing we're going to do is take a history. And a lot of you have probably heard of Socrates before. But let me go through exactly what we're looking for. The first thing is sight. The specific question that we're asking is, is the sight of the headache kind of all over? Is it on one side? Um, or is it actually not the head, really? It's, it, well, it's not the, not the scalp, per se, but it, it's the eye. All of these will suggest different pathologies, and it's a really helpful, important question. The next thing is onset. Is it something that has taken some time to build up, or is it something that's really happened today? And it's the worst headache that they've ever had. It's the first time they've ever had it. It's, it's, it's a terrible headache, and that's a really helpful thing. Versus, is it happening all the time? It's intermittent. They get it once in a while. They've had it for several years. The fact is, if they've had it for several years or several months and it hasn't caused them any problems until now, it's very unlikely to be something dangerous. The next thing is character. Is it a kind of general dull ache? Is it something that's really sharp and shooting? Where's the radiation? Is it going to the eye? Is it going down the neck? Associated features. So what we're looking for is, is this some sort of systemic disease um, that's causing headache as a presenting symptom? And so do they have systemic um, symptoms like, do they have a fever or night sweats or weight loss? Or is it something that's affecting their brain? Um, and so are we looking for somebody who has got a neurology? So neurological symptoms like confusion or seizures or weakness or numbness or problems with their speech. What's the time frame of this? Is it, is it something that's come on in the context of, of an hour, two hours? Is it something that's been happening for, for quite some time? What factors are exacerbating and alleviating the symptoms? Because different things will cause an increase in severity of the symptom. And how severe is it? We're very worried about the headaches where they are saying it's 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10 the most severe headache they've ever had. So ask them not just how severe is it, but also how severe is it relate, relative to, your, to, to the headaches that you've had in the past? Because we know that pretty much everyone has ever had a headache at some point in their lives. Past medical history, really important to ask specific questions that I'll go through in a second, um, because certain past medical conditions will make you much more worried about a headache. Drug history, 
Certain medications uh, may predispose you to a headache, but also things like the contraceptive pill may, may mean that you're at higher risk of having a clotting disorder, such as a venous thrombosis in your brain. Family history, um, are there conditions that run in the family, um, which might be explaining why this headache is happening, and then social history, specifically what's happening in their lives right now. Because we all know when we're stressed, we're worried, we're anxious, we're hungry, we're tired, we all get a bit of a headache. Um, but also, do they smoke? Do they drink? Um, is it, a lot of headaches that are exacerbated by alcohol. Um, and so that's uh, something to think about also. And then we're going to go on to perform an exam. And I think the key parts of the examination are the observations, specifically the blood pressure. And what we're looking for is the blood pressure. Uh, we'd be very worried if the blood pressure was above 200 and be relatively worried if it were above 180. That this is the systolic blood pressure I'm talking about. A general examination, does the patient in front of you look well or unwell? Your patient with meningitis is gen generally gonna look unwell. And a neurological examination, is there something wrong with their neurology? Do they look weak? Do they look numb? Is there problems with their speech? Is there problems with their walking, their balance? Is there something off neurologically? Because again, that's concerning. And so the way we're going to contextualize how we assess a patient is by looking at Mr. Andrews. Mr. Andrews is a 51 year old male who presents with headache. He could present anyway. He could present to primary care, secondary care. Um, he, you could, this could be a call out uh, uh, and you've arrived as part of the ambulance service. I mean, wherever the case is tells you it's severe and it's making him nauseous. That's pretty much every person who ev you ever view with a headache. And you perform an examination, a normal general neurological examination, blood pressure's fine. What specific things are we looking for? Well, what we need to do is we need to decide whether this man needs to come into hospital, um, where, wherever we are, whether we're in ED, whether you're part of me, the medical team, and we need to work out whether we can discharge this patient and they're safe or they need to come in. These are all the red flags we're looking for. We're looking for a headache which is intense and hyperacute, a thunderclap headache. And what that means is they say this is the worst headache of their lives. It's severe. It's come on uh, in the space of a few hours, um, max a day, and it's really, really, really bad. We're also worried in people who have a new onset of headaches and they're above 50 or, or below 10. Children really shouldn't have headaches, but I'm not a children's doctor, so I'll focus on the 50 plus. Um, so this is a new character, a new type of headache that they've never had before. And it's and, and they're over 50. That would be of concern. If they're wet, if they look well otherwise, it doesn't mean that they urgently need to come in, but it can mean that that's a bit of a red flag, that something something might be a bit odd because people shouldn't suddenly start getting headaches. And if they're above 50, they're much more likely to have um, serious things wrong with them. Past history. So cancer, anyone who's got an active cancer, there is a possibility that all symptoms of, a, of cancer like weight loss, night sweats, there's a chance that they've got cancer that has metastasized to the brain. A brain tumor or a metastasis is incredibly rare. Um, what's it? I mean, of people coming to coming with a headache, um, maybe one in a thousand, one in two thousand will have some sort of um, malignancy, some sort of cancer. I mean, it, we're, we're talking absolutely minimal numbers. I think it's zero point zero four five percent off the top of my head. Um, HIV, um, so patients with HIV, particularly if it's uncontrolled, that's a, that's a risk. They, they are much, or any really, any proper immunocompromised patient, they're at risk of developing cerebral infections. Pregnancy, um, we worry about these patients uh, with respect to their blood pressure. And so that's, if, if they're pregnant, you really need to measure their blood pressure. Um, but also because they're at risk, higher risk of clotting disorders, just like with the oral contraceptive pill. Persistent and morning headaches. Um, so if the headache is happening all of the time, it suggests that there's something actually wrong with the patient that's always wrong. 
Whereas your serious underlying pathology doesn't come and go away and therefore the headache doesn't come and go away. An early morning headache though is more concerning. So particularly if they wake up with the headache or the headache wakes them up. Um, because that suggests that the pressure in their brain when they're, when they're lying down, um, essentially the brain is under higher pressure. And so any condition which causes raised intracranial pressure, i.e. the brain space is a bit more under pressure, um, will, will be worse in, in the morning. If the headache is progressive, if it's progressing over weeks um, and it's not going away, that suggests that something intrinsically is wrong with the patient and it's getting worse and it's getting more dangerous. And then finally, um, perhaps one of the most important is neurology. If they've got any weakness, if they've got any sensory abnormalities, if they're having seizures, very much if they're having confusion or any other neurological sign. If they've got new neurological signs, that is bad. They need to, they need to come to hospital. And what we're looking for are secondary headaches, some sort of serious underlying pathology that is presenting as a headache. And that's what we're looking for. And that's why we're asking these red flags. Again, bear in mind that this is less than 10% of patients coming with a headache, usually less than 5%. And so, oops, um, secondary causes of headaches. Well, I've highlighted a couple in red that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit more detail, but, but this is the list. I'm sorry it's a bit text heavy, but some of my slides are, and I do apologize for that. Um, but I'll be going through them. So, subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, venous sinus thrombosis, well, they tend to present very similarly. Uh, they tend to present with a severe onset, which causes quite sudden onset headache. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But anybody with a sudden onset headache, that's the most severe of them uh, that they've had should come in. We will evaluate whether it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage or venous sinus thrombosis when they come to me on the acute medical take. But for, your, for, for most of you, you're just gonna send them into hospital and admit them under the medical team. Malignant hypertension. Um, so essentially, again, this is where we're looking for a blood pressure really above 200. Um, above 180 would perhaps give us some concern, particularly if it was new, um, but above 200 uh, would tend to concern us. Infective causes. Um, so if the, if the patient's got meningitis encephalitis, and I'll talk more about that afterwards, space occupying lesions like um, tumors, giant cell arthritis. Um, and then the other things to bear in mind are glaucoma and carbon monoxide poisoning. Glaucoma, uh, glaucoma tends to present more with kind of eye features. It's a kind of hard eye, a headache, but it's more about the eye rather than the head. So it really shouldn't be a headache per se, but it can present as well. Um, and carbon monoxide poisoning, really, um, that should be something that gets flagged up when multiple people in the household are, are all feeling a bit sick. So let's talk about these four in a little bit more detail subarachnoid hemorrhages okay so this is a this is when you get bleeding into the brain this is a big thing that we're all worried about when we hear bad severe headache this is a sudden severe headache in a person who's often hypertensive the blood um, as you can see that that kind of white area on that ct scan is can represent blood um well, most likely represents blood, but what it can do is it can irritate the lining of the brain called the meninges. And so these patients may have meningism. I'll talk about what that, what that means in a second. Um, investigations, well, when they come to hospital, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a CT scan. And actually a CT scan done within four hours will pretty much rule out 90 to 95% of subarachnoid hemorrhages but we usually want to be absolutely sure. So if we're really suspecting a patient's got subarachnoid hemorrhage, i.e. the pre-positive, uh, sorry, the pre-assessment uh, is so, so high, we're, we're very, very sure. Um, we will go on to do a lumbar puncture, which we have to do after 12 hours, because essentially we need to get that, that blood that's up in the brain to mix in with the rest of their CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, navigate all the way down to their lower back so that we can detect it when we do a puncture of their lower back and get some of that sample. This is rare. Um, in all of the lumbar punches I've done and all of the lumbar punches I've seen, which are many, many, I have not had one patient who 
actually had a subarachnoid diagnosed on lumbar puncture. They've all been diagnosed on CT and just sent across. Um, but overall, the condition itself is, is fairly rare. Meningitis and encephalitis. So uh, this is your patient with, tends to be a gradual onset headache um, over the course of 24 to 48 hours. They once again have meningism because it's their meninges that are irritated and inflamed, hence meningitis. Um, but they tend to look unwell and they're feverish. Um, encephalitis, uh, where, where the brain is itself is affected, uh, the patients tend to have seizures. Um, when they come to hospital, we'll do a set of blood tests, yeah, a lumbar puncture to confirm. But if you are concerned that you think this patient has got meningitis, meningococcal meningitis, um, i.e. that kind of rapid onset, unwell looking patient, feverish, uh, you can give the antibiotics as per whatever guidelines you have locally. Uh, often can be benzyl penicillin and various other drugs. Um, and you can give them whilst you're awaiting the ambulance if you're on the GP service. Ambulance services will often carry these you really don't want to miss the boat. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about meningism. So I've got this video. Um, it was the best video I could find. I appreciate the um, person doing this examination. Looks a little um, odd, perhaps almost creepy, oops. Um, but essentially, um, Koenig's sign is the thing that people often test, which is where you're flexing the patient's leg like this. Um, and then once you do that, what you're doing is you're, once you've created that angle, the patient should be fairly comfortable. And then you try and straighten out that knee. And when you straighten out that knee, um, what you often find is that the patient will, will get quite tender. And um, so when you raise that leg and you straighten out that knee, um, they may develop some pain, which is suggestive of meningeal, meningeal irritation. They may flex their head. They may flex their um, other leg. But overall, Koenigstein is not a very sensitive marker. You can't say, oh, Koenigstein is negative. Therefore, they do not have meningism. So that overall, it makes it not that great a sign. Um, because either you're pretty convinced the patient has meningitis, therefore a Koenig sign is a little value, um, but a positive sign is there. Or um, you're not too sure, you do a Koenig sign, it's negative, and you're still not sure because you really can't use a Koenig sign to rule out uh, meningism. The, ten, the features that actually help with meningism are those patients who are photophobic. So they really cannot look at lights, uh, Literally, they, they will do everything not to look at lights. Um, and so that tends to, be, um, it tends to be your cardinal feature, but also that they have a stiff neck, um, which kind of relates to this kerning sign. That's what you're really looking for, that kind of stiffness and that irritation of, of, their, um, uh, of, of their meningeal lining. And so if you ask them to flex their neck, i.e. touch their chin to their... Um, to their chest, they will not be able to do that as much as they try because they will be in severe pain. They're helpful signs. Um, that said, if you are suspecting somebody has meningitis because they are looking unwell, or you're suspecting somebody has a subarachnoid hemorrhage because they have the most severe pe headache they've ever had, you should, you should go for the safer option, which is to have this patient assessed. Space occupying lesions, as I said, are vanishingly rare. Really, really rare. The, these are um, usually a cancer from elsewhere, which is migrated into the brain, and even more rarely, um, a cancer in the brain, so a primary brain tumor. They tend to present with a gradual onset of headache with neurology and seizures, but actually they tend to present with neurology and seizures and not really a headache. Um, but if they do have raised intracranial pressure, they may get that early morning headache, particularly with that nausea or vomiting. Um, what we'll do is we will examine their eyes to have a look for papilledema. But what you're looking for in these patients are those night sweats, weight loss, lumps, bleeding, basically anything that suggests they've got cancer. Because it's more likely that they've got a cancer elsewhere that that's gone to the brain rather than its primary brain tumour. And our investigations of choice are to begin with a CT scan and then on, onward to an MRI scan to 
fully delineate, delineate what's happening and treat more depend on etiology. And then the final one, which is giant cell arteritis. So giant cell arteritis classically affects females. It classically affects people who are elderly. The, the kind of average age is about in the 70s, about 71. Um, but it can affect anyone above 50 and really only affects people who are above 55. And what, what they describe is they describe temporal pain. So pain around the temple with tenderness. Um, they often get worsening pain on mastication or chewing. Um, they can have sudden loss of vision. That's a really dangerous sign in a giant cell arteritis. Um, but also they have kind of general features of inflammation, that kind of chronic inflammation of everywhere it tends to make them all a little stiff, tends to make them all a little bit tired, exhausted. Um, and they often have polymyalgia rheumatica, whereas where they have shoulder and um, hip girl uh, stiffness. The investigations of choice are a CRP and ESR because it's quite rare for patients to have normal inflammatory markers and then have this inflammatory condition. Um, but ultimately we'll want to do a biopsy of, of, of their temporal artery to have a look and confirm this diagnosis because we don't want to give steroids, which is the treatment of choice if they're not necessary. So let's summarize. Mr. Andrews comes to you wherever you are and he's a 51 year old presenting with a headache. What you're going to do is you're going to take a history with Socrates in the forefront of your mind, specifically looking for the red flag of, is this a new headache and are you above 50? Is this the worst headache you've ever had? Is this a morning headache, particularly with nausea? Is this a progressive headache that you've had coming on for a long while and isn't intermittent, it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse over the space of days to weeks? Um, well, really weeks. Um, do you have a history of active cancer or of, or of HIV that's uncontrolled? You're then gonna do a neurological examination and some observations to have a look for a blood pressure. If any of those features suggest that this is a dangerous headache, that's gonna make you think, oh, I need to do something about this. Most of the time, as I said, only about 90 to 95% of the time, uh, well, sorry, five to 10% of the time is it gonna be a dangerous headache. Um, most of the time it's not. And so let's spend a little moment talking about primary headaches. So primary headaches are where the headache is the main feature, the headache is the main diagnosis. It's not something else that's causing the headache. Um, and often these are the much safer, um, less worrying headaches. So primary headaches include tension headaches, migraines, um, medication overuse is technically a secondary headache because it's secondary to the medication, but we'll lump it here as a primary headache because it tends to be a primary headache that gets worse because of medication overuse. Um, and cluster headaches. So these are our four most common uh, primary headaches. There's loads of others, um, but these account for perhaps 70 to 80% of the headaches you're, you're likely to see. Uh, they'll fit into one of these kinds of domains. So let's spend a moment to talk about H1. Again, I apologize for the next four slides, which are all text heavy. Um, but the idea of this is so that you've got all the information so you can screenshot it, or I can send the slides across to you guys. Um, so you have all of that kind of key information on one slide um, as a kind of flashcard to tension type headaches. But let's talk about each of them. Tension type headache is the headache that we all get. It's the type of headache that you're gonna get watching this presentation if you've done an entire day of work, you haven't eaten lunch, now you're uh, listening to me drone on about headaches. And so headaches are the forefront of your mind. And that's the kind of headache you're gonna get. It's, it's that headache that we all experience, that vice-like tension, basically pushing across our, across our heads uh, and it happens very frequently. Some people will get it every day. Um, some people will get it after certain things. Um, particularly things like feeling tired or hungry or stressed or dehydrated. The thing is, when you get these headaches, you feel a bit uncomfortable. You feel like you can't concentrate, but it doesn't really imp impact your activities of daily living in a significant way. You can do what you need to do. 
you just don't enjoy doing what you need to do because it's just added stress, added tension. Um, and so the treatment here is reassurance because often if you're stressed about your headache, your headache's worse. So reassurance is actually really important here. You do not have a brain tumor. You do not have a serious headache. Yes, the headache is causing you lots of trouble, but the good thing is there's no underlying dangerous disorder that's doing this. What we need to do is focus on getting the headache better. It's all about the symptoms. We don't have to actually also deal with a life-threatening disorder. Often it's best not to tell these patients that the headache isn't serious because they get very angry at you because it's serious for them. They need to avoid these triggers, as I said. Exercise and well-being advice can help. Um, just doing those things that we're all meant to be doing, like sleep hygiene, um, exercising, dieting, and other things that just generally make you feel a bit better about yourself, eating a healthy diet. If it's occasional, you can consider simple um, analgesia, um, things like paracetamol, um, NSAIDs. Um, but if it's happening regularly, you really don't want the patient taking those regularly because essentially they're going to develop a medication overuse headache. And so avoid analgesia in these circumstances. You may, in certain circumstances, particularly if there's a psychosocial overlay, consider a tricyclic antidepressant like amitriptyline. But classically, these kinds of headaches are best managed conservatively with reassurance, avoiding triggers, and just general well-being tips. Next is migraine. All of us have pretty much heard of a migraine. Migraines are, well, they'll floor you. That They will make you feel really rubbish for a few, for a day or a few days. They're severe. They're often unilateral. They can also have photophobia and hence the challenge of is this meningism or is this something simply a migraine? But the helpful thing is often people with migraines have them quite frequently. So helpful for us because it means that it's probably not less, uh, it's less likely to be something serious if they've had this kind of a headache before. Less helpful for them because it's really, really horrible having this again and again. So they can have photophobia, so difficulty looking at lights and vomiting. They also tend to have phonophobia, which means they hate loud sounds. Um, so often you'll find these patients describe that they're in bed with their covers over their face and they just don't, don't feel well. They can look at the light, um, the light bothers them, but it doesn't, but they're not proper phobic usually um, in that their headache gets really, really bad, like it would do in meningism. Um, and they may have an aura associated. So prior to the headache, usually um, they might have odd visual symptoms like zigzags or, or things looking a little bit weird, flashes, um, or they may get sensory pathology like down one side. Um, the triggers uh, tend to be, so tend to be food for some people. Um, so wine and chocolate tend to be specific triggers. Uh, for other people, sex. Um, and also there's a whole group of people that have menstruation headaches. So they'll have it every month around the period. And so, I mean, all of these are really terrible because essentially they can cause you so much hassle because of how frequently they happen and how painful they are. So again, reassurance is helpful. Reassurance that yes, it is a very serious headache, but it doesn't represent a serious underlying disorder that we, that's life-threatening. You need to avoid the triggers. Um, if you're on an oral contraceptive pill, you need to stop it. The reason being is that the combination of an oral contraceptive pill and migraines massively increases your risk of stroke relative to just one or the other. Um, and usually we'll treat with uh, aspirin or ibuprofen, basically NSAIDs um, and antiemetics if vomiting is a component of the headache. Um, they tend to be very helpful. Um, so, for example, if, if your headache is, uh, is, is caused by sex, um, people might take high-dose aspirin um, before they're about to have sex to kind of prevent that headache. So NSAIDs tend to be very helpful in this situation. Um, the other, um, the next kind of second line um, would be kind of, again, NSAIDs, but like PR NSAIDs, so rectal NSAIDs, like diclofenac. 
Um, but often patients don't really like that. Um, although, to be fair, if they're having a migraine, they won't mind because it's more uncomfortable to have the migraine than to have something uh, given rectally. Um, so the next thing that um, patients um, often find really helpful are triptans, it's like simtriptan. You need to be careful in these patients, so they need to have no cardiovascular disease to rebrovascular disease or hypertension because triptans can make these things worse. And often patients don't tolerate them, so you might need to go for a lower dose or try different, different triptans um, because they might get uh, nausea, they might get dizziness, dry mouth, feeling a bit sleepy, or kind of flushing episodes. And so triptans aren't always well tolerated, but, but they are very uh, effective medications. Simitriptan um, and other triptans can be given in multiple different routes, oral, subcar, intranasal. Um, I really like the kind of subcar, well, intranasal formulations because as soon as you start to feel them, you can take it and it works very quickly. Uh, but usually because with migraines, they tend to come over some time, oral triptans can really work for, for, for this condition. Um, next, um, we can talk a little bit about medication overuse headaches. So with medication overuse headaches, um, we're talking about a headache, which is as a result of them taking too much medication. So medication overuse headaches tend to be tend to be occurring all the time. So about 15 days per month. Um, so pretty much half of the time you've got a headache. And they're using analgesia just as frequently. So at least a third to a half of the month. Because what happens is when they're having all of these medications, the body gets used to it. So when the body gets used to it, um, what, what the body does is it increases the number of pain uh, receptors and the sensitivity of these receptors, which means that essentially the body is almost ready and available to feel more pain with everything. It tends to occur with more frequently with things that you tend to build up a tolerance to, like tryptans or opiates. It tends to affect NSAIDs less but it's, it's quite common in NSAIDs because of how common NSAIDs are. It's a very difficult condition to treat. The reason it's a very difficult condition to treat is because these patients are just not, are going to feel really uncomfortable with you suggesting that their headache is due to the fact they're taking too much medication. So it really takes a lot of communication skills to get this point across. We know that when you have painkillers regularly, your body compensates for this by getting used to them and upregulating up -regulating all of the receptors and things that feel pain. As a result, every single headache that you feel gets worse. And so in that context, ongoing use of medications actually makes your headaches worse. The treatment for this is we need your body to reset. We need your body to reset its pain uh, assessment so you don't feel as frequent and as severe a headache. And so what we, what we need you to do is we need you to stop taking your medications. And unfortunately, for the first few days, that's gonna make things worse. It's gonna make things worse for perhaps up to 10 days whilst your body resets. But as soon as it does reset, you're gonna have a lot less headaches because at the moment you're having headaches half the month at the moment. And so it's really important that we get you off this so you're not gonna have as frequent a headache. In the context of those 10 days, um, you can give people um, NSAIDs if, if NSAIDs aren't the cause of, of the headache because they can help um, prevent the um, this kind of withdrawal episode. But the really important thing, once again, is reassurance. Um, reassuring them that, yes, I know you've got a headache so frequently. Yes, I know it's very severe, but it doesn't represent a serious life-threatening underlying disorder. 
rather than having to treat both the serious underlying disorder and a headache, we only have to treat the headache. So this is good news. Because often patients will find it bad news that you haven't found a serious underlying disorder because they're like, well, then, then is this all in my head? Or then I'm never going to get better. It, 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 you, once you have that headache so frequently and feel so awful, you often feel like you actually want to find that underlying reason. Why is this happening to me? So as I said, they require so much support in terms of getting off their medications or getting off their alcohol or getting off anything else they use to treat it. So you may need to involve um, psychiatry, psychology, um, addiction teams. Um, they may, may need to go for talking therapy. There's a lot of things that they might need. And because of how common these headaches are, um, we really need to help support them and, and basically help stop these but hence a very important question once you've done your assessment and you've ruled out that it is a serious pathology and that it is more likely something like this is working out how many medications do you take how often do you take them because again that can be really helpful and reassuring that you know that this is not a life-threatening or serious disorder and then we've got cluster headache cluster headache is more rare um, it affects about one in a thousand people. Um, it com more commonly affects men, uh, men in their 20s to 40s. And these are terrible. People often say this is pretty much the worst pain they've ever had in their lives. And it's literally the worst pain they'll ever have in their lives. These are incredibly painful. They're called cluster headaches because they happen in the cluster. So they happen several times a day for several weeks, and then they stop, usually. And they will stop for a period of time, and the patient will be absolutely fine for a, a while, and then they'll suddenly start again, and they will be back to square one. The, each episode per day tends to last 45 to 90 minutes, and they'll have maybe one or two or three episodes per day, usually. And then it will go on for several weeks. You tend to have eye symptoms with these headaches. So you tend to have on the same side of this kind of unilateral headache. So you can see this man clutching one side of his face. He also has eye symptoms. He has watering of his eye. He has a runny nose, so lacrimation and runny rear. Uh, and he may get sweating again, just on that one side. And conjunctival injection, i.e. redness of the eye. The eye, it tends to be very, very irritated um, in this cluster headache. As all um, of our primary headaches, the first thing is reassurance. And the second thing is to avoid triggers. Um, so alcohol and smoking can be quite potent triggers. Um, smoking can kind of make, make you more likely to progress um, to a kind of chronic version of this, these cluster headaches. Um, and alcohol can be also particularly um, particularly dangerous in that it can really trigger, trigger something like this. They really do need to stop drinking alcohol. The uh, treatment choice is super uh, simtriptan again, um, triptan rather than triptin. Um, apologies for the typo. Um, but essentially, you want to use a much faster acting because the headaches go from zero to, oh my gosh, they're awful very quickly. And so you really do want to consider a intranasal or subcut formulation because they're far more effective. The other thing that you might consider is giving 100% oxygen. This is really effective actually. About 80 to 90% of um, cluster headaches will pretty much just stop um, a secondary to um, just giving 100% oxygen, so much so that some patients may actually be given oxygen to take home, yeah, like an oxygen canister, um, where you can be kind of prescribed that um, through home oxygen services. And they will take that uh, during their kind of episode of where they're, when they're developing clusters such that they can, uh, they can treat it. It's so very much, much more effective than you'd expect. Prophylaxis also exists, um, things like verapamil or prednisolone to kind of prevent these from, from occurring. 
So what we're going to do next is we're going to summarize and um, really making sure that you're taking all the important points home. First are your red flags. Once again, you're looking for a severe worst headache in their lives. You're looking for a progressive headache that's gotten worse over weeks um, and isn't intermittent. You're looking for an early morning headache, particularly one that wakes them up. You're looking for associated neurology. Do they have new numbness, weakness, sensory problems, balance problems, speech problems, seizures? And then you're finally asking about past medical history. Are they pregnant? Um, do they have cancer? Do they have HIV? Um, are they on, are they on uh, oral contraceptive pill? Are they taking, um, yeah, are they taking the oral contraceptive pill? What you're worried about are secondary headaches. And what we've talked about is the subarachnoid hemorrhage, which presents with severe onset of pain, um, often with meningism, but it's the worst headache of their lives. Meningitis and encephalitis, this is infection, so presenting with a generally unwell looking patient. With meningitis, they, they also will have, uh, will usually have meningism. Um, this is a very worrying and life-threatening disorder, just like subarachnoid hemorrhages. And so we'll be looking for features of meningism, such as photophobia, neck stiffness, sorry, photophobia, neck stiffness, problems looking at light. And we'll be doing the test where we get them to touch their chin to their chest to see if that, um, to see if they've got that neck stiffness. The other things we'll be considering is space occupying lesion, but usually most people will be considering it and actually they're vanishingly rare. So you don't tend to need to worry about that, but these are your patients with neurological features. And finally, giant cell arteritis. Um, that's more classic, your primary care uh, patient that you'll be worried about that, but again, quite rare. But uh, inflammatory markers will be raised and more worrying if they've started to develop um, so they've had visual loss as a result. That means the patient needs urgent steroids. But the classic symptoms are the kind of unilateral headache, tenderness at the temporal of the temporal artery, um, shoulder stiffness, inability to kind of comb their hair and lift their arm up, um, and that, that pain on chewing that we described. But the vast majority of headaches will be primary headaches. So 90 to 95% of them will be primary, of which these are the most common. Your tension headache, which is your band-like headache, secondary to uh, feeling stressed, tired, exhausted. Your migraine, presenting with a unilateral headache, often with aura, visual and sensory symptoms, um, with quite severe um, problems with sound, light, um, and feeling quite nauseous, that happen quite regularly, usually lasting about two days. Your medication overuse headaches, where they are taking way too many and we need to get them to stop and reassure them. And finally, your cluster headaches, which present with those eye symptoms um, in batches lasting about 45 to 90 minutes uh, several times a day. Um, shameless plug, uh, this is my website. Um, you guys are welcome to visit. There's a whole host of um, articles and free resources of things that I've written or other um, doctors or healthcare professionals have written, um, including an article on headache. And finally, on to some questions. Um, so I'll stop sharing there. And that is my um, presentation over.